Well, first of all, how are you doing this morning? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well, thank you for asking. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Um, I had the chance to uh, watch the movie last week, and I really was quite taken by it. I, I, it has a lot of particular elements that I, I always kind of engage with when it comes to uh, horror movies and something that's just, just little things that personally, like, I, I really appreciate uh, when a horror movie does it. And so I, I really enjoyed the movie on the whole, so... Where did you? Uh, where did the inspiration for the movie come from? So this is the same producing team that worked together on our last film, The Dinner Party, which was released um, in 2020. Uh, myself, Lindsay Ann Williams, Wesley O'Merrick, James Boulian. Um, we had a grand time working together on that project, and we wanted to put something else together very quickly to capitalize on the momentum that that, that project had generated. And my co-writer on Dinner Party, Michael Donovan Horn, had uh, the frame of a script on this this, this idea, this kernel uh, of the, the wild hunt. And uh, he sent it along to me. I thought the, the bones were good, but the story and the characters just needed some fleshing out. We needed to sort of dig down in, get our hands dirty. And we did. And, and together, um, with the help of Lindsay, who's, who's uh, always rife uh, with right there and, and, and has incredible creative ideas, we, we pinned down some really important narrative points, points, for example, explicit identification of Kernunos as our demigod hunter figure who has ties to, to Roman Gaul and Celtic history and to the Germanic hunt god um, Herney with whom his name is Cognatic. Um, so we started doing some research into Kernunos and the, and the mythos surrounding the Black Forest in Germany and, and these wild hunt uh, narratives. And um, it's just a very rich um, uh, playground. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so, yeah, we uh, made, some, made some, some character changes. Uh, initially, the character of Amalia was... Um, a boy and, and a little older, but we really wanted to say something about the relationship of daughters to um, controlling or, or oppressive patriarchal figures, father figures, fathers, grandfathers, you name it. Mm -hmm. And um, especially with regard to, and, and to find a connection between uh, Robin and Amalia, Robin and her relationship to Carl, her deceased grandfather, and then Amalia and Arthur, uh, whom we see in the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so, so as as we just as we to ask harder questions, things began to come together, and we were feeling really good about where the story was going. Um, we liked the idea that it was a limited location film, which on an indie budget is always the big consideration. Uh, this is effectively a cabin and and this woods mm -hmm. uh, um, location. Um, limited cast uh, as well. And of course, thinking about doing a film, shooting film during COVID, the fact that the cast was limited, that many of the locations were exterior locations, worked to our benefit. Now, we we're shooting in December 2020 uh, in, in Mississippi and on a, in a particularly cold Mississippi winter. A few nights, the temperatures got down into the 20s and, and low 30s. Um, so, so it wasn't without <laughs> a little... <laughs> A little pain and complication, but um, but the it, everything just made sense in terms of, of what we were trying to do and when we wanted to shoot it, um, especially given given the pall of COVID that was hanging over our head. Um, but the mm -hmm. the Kernunus mythology and the, and just the mythology of of vegetation deities in general is just utterly fascinating. I mean, these are the deities that that guard and command the natural world and, and the land and the crops and the beasts of the field and human beings ability to, um, to muster those, those elements and, uh, in, in the service of their very survival. Um, and when you cross a vegetation deity, it's oftentimes bad news. Uh, somebody like Dionysus might turn you into a vine or a tree or something. Kernuna is typically a little bit more benevolent, uh, in the mythos. And we, we pushed him, uh, a bit further in the other direction, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, we really, uh, really had a lot of fun with with this story and the <clears> tour. 
Yeah, you mentioned the uh, the the limited uh, setting of the cabinet and the uh, woods, and one of the things that I really have always kind of appreciated over the years is if a movie uses the woods almost as a sort of as its own character in the movie as opposed to just a setting. And I was thinking about movies like The Witch and The Ritual and mm-hmm. stuff like that as far as the you and the way that um Nathan Tate, your cinematographer, and you shoot the woods here, I, I think you do get a certain degree of, you do get a lot of personality out of the woods in making it feel almost oppressive as a in a in a way in almost an engulfing in terms of the the characters getting stuck there and that that's one of the things that I really appreciate about the film and that's one of those things that I personally if a horror movie is able to do that I think is is really interesting and really uh really makes the movie something more than just the uh narrative I, pr- I appreciate you saying that. Uh, it, yeah, if you're going to have effectively one location, it better be a great location. And if you're going to build an entire narrative around the quality of these woods, they better be like a in and of themselves. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the witch. Um, we certainly were, were playing in that sandbox of folk, folk horror and, and other films that come to mind. It comes at night uh, or The Keep or Wicker Man from the 1970s. I mean, the, the, the environment the natural world, uh, the trees and uh, all that stuff, the streams, uh, these, we wanted these to be integral players uh, in the narrative. And so in spite of the fact that the locations were limited, we knew we had to find a location that, and, and shoot that location uh, to give that vibe. So I'm glad it came off. Mm-hmm. Uh, when did uh, Rachel Nichols come into the uh, film? So... Um, you know, I knew I, I needed an actor for this role of Robin who could play both strength and vulnerability. Um, I, I knew it, it needed to be somebody who was going to be totally game because we were going to put her through the ringer in, mm-hmm. in the, the, those very woods that we're talking about. Um, I've been a fan of Rachel's work uh, for some time. And as it turns out, our casting director, Brandy Goldman, had, had worked with Rachel before and cast Rachel in another project. So when we were um, looking for somebody to play this role um, – she recommended Rachel and he recommended Rachel. And, you know, I thought, are, are we able to be able to get somebody like Rachel on our indie budget? Uh, but we, we sent her the script and, and she liked it and we were able to work, work something out. And I was really gratified that Rachel took a leap of faith on our comparatively small film. This was the first film she did uh, after the pandemic broke out. So really trusting her not only as you know an actor, but but knowing that we were going to take care of her and we were going to do things safely um, during COVID, um, it, it meant a great deal to me, and we just had a tremendous experience with Rachel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I appreciate that this this is very easily a part that could have just devolved into just just simply being a horrified wim- woman in in mm-hmm. a moment of horror. And I, I think one of the things, and it's, I, I think it's as much in the uh, script as is in her performance that this, we, we feel like we're actually watching an actual character here. And I think that's certainly the, and you mentioned Amelia, the character of Amelia earlier. And I think especially in the end, when you see these characters and that are in the situation that they're in, and you've seen them and you've seen the progression of these characters in terms of their dynamic and what that dynamic was and what that dynamic has almost sort of become. I I think that the the ideas that you uh, bring home and that you show in the uh, film with the flashbacks of uh, Robin with her uh, grandfather, I, I think that's one of those things that, it it's just that one it's it's just that one interesting uh little bond that you don't necessarily expect to see grow out of the movie when you first see the characters together but then as you as the film progresses you see it 
come through. And I, I it's I think that's one of the reasons that the movie is effective is as effective as it is. Well, I th thank you so much for that. Um, uh, we knew we needed that relationship, and in the writing phase, uh, that's why I think ultimately we we chose to go in a different direction with with that character, and, and Amalia was uh, the result. Um, and I think you know, s story is character, or character is story, and if your film is lacking in either one, um, it's it's not going to ultimately be successful. And um, and one of the one of sort of my missions, our missions at Historia Films, my production company, is to provide uh, richer, more complicated female leading roles. Um, you know, we know during the course of the history of our industry, uh, most of the time men are holding down those roles. And even when women have larger roles, men are doing most of the talking. So um, we tried very hard in our last few films um, to write roles for women that are rich and complicated and, and where you see a real arc and you see, um, uh, you know, the, the psychology of the character as she has to make very, very difficult uh, decisions um, uh, along her journey. And so, um, once again, having an actor like Rachel to inhabit that journey it, it was, was absolutely integral to our, our success. She really... She cares about the work. She cares about um, capturing your vision, the vision of the director or the writer. Um, she wants to make sure that that everybody's on the same page. She, she's very collaborative. She's she's happy to throw out ideas, um, which I love in an actor. But at the same time, if, if you know, if you say, uh, you know, I love your idea, but I, but I really feel like it ought to be this way. She's like, you got it, boss. Let's make it happen. You know, so. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you said. We thought with, with the Rob and Amalia relationship, I, the, the movie that kept coming to mind was Aliens with Newt mm. Ripley. Yeah. Um, and we so we sort of um, we let that that relationship inspire us, and in how you know Ripley becomes a mother figure to Newt, and at the end of the day is you know willing to sacrifice everything to protect her. Um, and 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 I think Rachel did a wonderful job of playing that energy in our film. Mm -hmm. uh, I I like that in the uh, about the halfway point you get to a lot of the big meat of the exposition. And I think that's having the woods and having that particular location. I think is makes that a much more compelling scene than it otherwise would have i i think if you if there had been a different setting and you know because it's hard to do exposition in movies and i think yeah. having 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 that saying having the characters be who the characters are and then afterwards you get into this moment where it almost becomes you you sort of turn it from a supernatural and occult movie into more of a slasher movie for a little bit and a chase film, there's a lot of different elements of horror. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, you know, and I, I think, I think slasher films can, you know, certainly there are terrible or plenty of terrible slasher films. And I think in, in this case though, it's, it's interesting because of the fact that you're also building to this climax where you return to the more supernatural elements, you return to the more thematic elements and uh, how that movie, how it progresses to there. And I, I think it's really, it, it was a really effective choice and one that I think that some movies in this, in, in this particular genre of uh, horror wouldn't necessarily have gone to. Well, I, I think you're, you're 100% correct. Exposition is hard. Um, it, it's not that... It, you should, I mean, every movie has exposition. Every movie, there, there's, there's a certain uh, set of information uh, that you have to know to, to, to understand what's going, what's going on in the film. Um, so the trick is, can you make it invisible? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you force the audience to forget that they're watching or listening to exposition? Um, so I think you're right. The, the setting in which a lot of the backstory is revealed helps that along in a major way. Um, with regard to uh, the gore in the film, we really wanted to choose our moments. 
we wanted to have a, a handful of uh, character story driven gore moments, slasher, as you say, moments without the film devolving into a slasher film. Not to knock those those films at all, yeah. but you know, it's, there's a like you said, there's a lot of bad ones. It's not that it can't be done well; it's just that it's often done poorly. You know, it's like Chardonnay. Mm. <laughs> it's not the variety. <laughs> it's just, it's a, it's often not done very well. Yeah. But um, so we wanted to choose those moments, and we wanted to make sure that they served the story and served our characters. So, you know, without giving away any spoilers, there are a handful of them, and we the effects that we used were almost entirely practical, which was a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. Just because I think nine times out of 10, practical effects look better, especially when it comes to blood. You know, mm -hmm. you see blood effects on, on, you know, digital blood effects sometimes, even on really big shows. And oftentimes it just doesn't come off. It looks like a piece of animation. And, um, and so um, thankfully we had our returning production designer, Julie Tosh and Ashley Predaway, our makeup department head, who really committed uh, to making those effects work. Uh, and I'm really pleased with, with how they turned out um, in the final film. Well, well, in addition to the uh, way that the forest is used and the way the woods are used, one of the, one of the other things I really appreciate about this movie is the uh, music, and in particular the fact that it's a uh, synthesized score as opposed to an orchestral one. I'm I'm a big fan of synth scores and I, I think they they really do capture something in I think horror that you know sometimes orchestral just is not really as effective with. Were there per, any particular influences that you wanted um the composer to play off of in Doing the score, was there a particular reason you you might have been interested in having more of a synthesized score than something more orchestral for this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we The composing style that we began with as our primary inspiration was Tangerine Dream. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you know their work, but they, they composed the scores of, of, of the early uh, Michael Mann stuff. Thief and the Keep, uh, Risky Business, mm -hmm. Firestarter, Legend, um, along with um, Vangelis. One of my favorite scores of all time is the score of Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. um, so we 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 sort of took those two styles, and then we wanted to amp it up a little bit with a little um, a, a little. If you put Brian May's guitar and Ennio Morricone's uh, guitars from the Sergio Leone stuff in the blender, um, and then added some Jerry Goldsmith style Omen choir. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, of course our choir in this movie is more, it's, it's more percussive. It's more, you know, it, kind of in your face, you know, there's a lot of, oomph and, oomph and th this kind of thing, a more ritualistic perhaps, uh, than the more traditional choir setting that, that he uses in something like, Awe Satani and the Omen, but um, so yeah, we absolutely had sort of a um, a music bed, a foundation um, that we were aspiring to, and then like like anything, it takes on a life of its own. But I mean, mm -hmm. I work with an amazing composer in Clifton Hyde. Clifton uh, is one of my oldest friends. He's composed five of my six features, and I think this is my favorite score to date. So uh, really, really pleased that you noticed that. And you're 100% right. We began with, we, we said we want this synth-based score, this kind of vintage V80s thing, um, and then we want to shake it up with some other elements. Yeah, I, I, I've i actually been like kind of obsessed with uh, Tangerine Dream score for uh, Sorcerer the past couple okay. of months. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely... So that's why I, you liked it, I guess. So yeah. We, we did something right. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, uh, I, definitely hear the, uh, I definitely hear the influence in there. Uh, beyond obviously the challenges that come into uh, making a movie in a time of COVID, what were some of the uh, other bigger challenges in the creative process of uh, making this movie, or the practical process of filming? Well, I think I think the biggest one was the setting. We we 
the large majority of this film takes place outdoors. Um, we are shooting in December. Um, it's cold winter. Uh, we're not only dealing with the cold, but we're dealing with periodic rain. Um, I mean, it, the cold is great when you can stand it. It looks great on the screen when you can see the actor's breath. I mean, they're supposed to be in the Black Forest in Germany during the winter solstice, so it works beautifully. But it's not an entirely pleasant experience to be shooting in. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the elements were certainly a logistical challenge. Um, we're working with minor so, you know, there are only so many hours we can use uh, Rachel Riles, who plays Amali, who's wonderful in the film, and, and her mom, Regina, came out and, and was with us because we were sequestered the whole time at this campground, mm -hmm. Little Black Creek. Um, so that, that is a challenge as well. And then, as you mentioned, the COVID protocols. I mean, we're testing for COVID three or four times a week, sanitation protocols. When we're indoors, we're using HEPA filtration up to the point that we're shooting we actually had a, a, a scare where an actor flew in from Los Angeles, tested positive for COVID before arriving at set. So the protocols worked. The actor never came to set, but we had to shake up the cast uh, as a result of, of that actor not being able to do our show because you can't just – on an indie budget, you can't just push. Yeah. you gotta, you got to just keep moving forward. Um, and, and ultimately it turned out, I think – um, in the best interest of the film, it, it, the result was Elena Sanchez was elevated into the role of Latara um, from a smaller role, and Elena Sanchez was an absolute MVP on the show. Uh, she's fluent in German. Since we're sequestered the whole time, even when she wasn't shooting, she, she wanted to come to set and help us with our dialect, make sure our German was on point. So not only did we have a, a German... Um, dialect coach in New York who's working with us remotely, Oliver Hoffman, but we also had Elena on set. So some things, um, some takes really do work out uh, for the best, and, and, and I think that one did. Um, but yeah, it was a hard shoot. It was a really, it was a really hard shoot. Um, um, but what we had going for us was a group of people that were really committed to the vision. Nate Tape and I had been um, sorry, planes flying overhead, but uh, Nate Tape and I had been working on this look, this visual aesthetic of this film for several months before shooting it. So we had a very specific idea of what we wanted to do. Um, and then Lindsay and Wesley um, and Jim and Julie Koch, and, uh, who, who's always so great in, in her art team, uh, they're all there for the right reasons. Um, it's not money because, you know, there's very little of it in our world, mm -hmm. um, but they believe in what we're doing and they're committed to seeing it through regardless of the, the ob obvious obstacles that are going to be thrown in your path. I mean, it's not a matter of whether fires are going to crop up on an indie film, but it, it, how are you going to deal with them when they do and how are you going to put them out? Um, there may have been a few more on this one for all the reasons I articulated, but uh, at the end of the day, this team pull through and, and, and hopefully we've created something special. Um, who, who are some of, who are some of the filmmakers that you've been inspired by over the years? Oh man, that's, that's hard. I mean, it, it, at some level it depends on, on what we're talking about. I mean, we just, just in terms of building a love of movies, um, I, I have to say Steven Spielberg. I mean, my favorite films uh, are Raiders of the Lost Ark and Jaw. I mean, always, you know, despite the fact that sometimes those films change, you know, your top, top week to week, those films are, uh, are always up there. And, and just the, uh, you know, time and again, he's, he's created a vision and a world that uh, I was totally drawn into. And, and whether it's those films or E.T. Or, or later on down the line, the, you know, Saving Private Ryan, the Omaha Beach sequence absolutely changed the game. Um, Schindler's List um, but then when I think about style um, I, I really like the style of Michael Mann mm -hmm. I like the way he frames I like the way he frames things I like I like his his use of Steadicam um, I like his use of ECUs um, in terms of ECUs also you gotta I gotta shout out Sergio Leone um, I mean he his close-ups are are practically operatic. I mean, they're, they're beautiful, beautiful portraity things. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the, my horror films are, are 
in, in a lot of ways inspired by the great 70s horror, um, like The Exorcist, of course, William Friedkin, um, The Omen, Rosemary's Baby. Um, and, and, you know, I, I also really love, you know, one of my favorite genres of film is, is character drama. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I love, uh, Richard Linklater, the before trilogy, I think is one of the great things ever committed to cinema. I, I love Noah Baumbach's work. Um, I love Sofia Coppola's Lost in Translation. Um, and her dad's Godfather wanted to, is pretty great as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Sidney Lumet and, and his character work. I mean, I could, I could really go, I could really go on and on and on, but, yeah. um, uh, those are a few, a, a few directors that, um, they really get me going. Okay. Well, Miles, thank you very much for your time today. Oh, it's been my absolute pre pleasure. I, I, I'm happy to be here and I'm, I really appreciate you covering our film. Oh.